Open your Bible to Acts the 8th chapter. Put your marker there if you want to, if you have a marker. If you're using a digital, I don't think a ribbon would help a whole lot. But um, we're going to be in Acts 8 this morning primarily. Do appreciate the presence of all. It's good to have several visiting with us, and it is good to see those of you who are here. It is, as Mike said, such a strange time, but I am thankful for those who are here. Those who are able to join us via the live stream and those who may be listening to this sometime later, um, I hope it, this will be beneficial to you. I'm going to be talking today, as I have announced, about the conversion of a religious man. You know, I, I find myself sometimes as I think about the spread of the gospel, my mind goes to passages like 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 and 11 where he talks about fornicators and idolaters and adulterers and homosexuals and sodomites and thieves and drunkards, revilers, covetous, extortioners. He said, and such were some of you. You know, in thinking about the radical change that was brought into the life of sinners through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I sometimes forget that a lot of the folks that we see converted in the study of Acts were folks who were not the fornicators and the drunkards, the extortioners. They were devoutly religious people. And yet, they still needed conversion. And there are some great lessons for us in that as we seek to spread the gospel. That yes, the fornicators and the idolaters, and the drunkards, and the thieves, they need the gospel. But sometimes there are folks who are very religious, but yet truly don't know Jesus in the New Testament way. Acts 8, 9, and 10, he puts together three consecutive accounts of conversion in which all three are religious people good people in many ways. The story of the eunuch, the story of Saul, and the story of Cornelius, all three of these are very different men. And as we in time come to them, we're going to learn some different things from each one. But think about the fact that all three of these were devout people, and yet they needed conversion too. Just to give you a quick overview of our setting to remind you where we are in the book of Acts the story all began at Jerusalem and yet when persecution arose in the 8th chapter they began to spread out and the big blue arrow points to the region of Samaria the story followed Philip one of the seven chosen to minister to the widows as he went up to Samaria and there was great work done in Samaria. But what we're going to see in the 8th chapter is the Lord now has a different work for him. And I want you to begin with me at verse 26. And I want us to read through verse 40. It's not a short reading, but I hope you'll read with me and think with me on this great story because... One of the things, I will say this, I've tried over the years to develop some abilities to tell a story, you know, but I can't tell a story the way God can tell a story. Let's allow God to tell us what happened. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him 
and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hindered water? And he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. The, the story opens there in Samaria, that the angel says, I want you to head south. And the blue line represents the road between Jerusalem and Gaza. And Gaza, of course, is well known today, the Gaza Strip, that place where the Palestinians live. And there's often conflict between the Palestinians of the Gaza Strip and Israel. But that's the direction he's headed. He goes toward that road. And as he's... Now, what, what can we take from this? What, what should we take from this? Well, there are probably some things we should take from it that I'm not going to cover this morning. But one of the things, and this is really a part of the entire book of Acts, but I think especially of these next few chapters, it points out the necessity of the gospel. And I'm saying that because Philip leaves Samaria because an angel speaks to him. Philip goes to a certain chariot because the Holy Spirit said, that's the chariot you're to go to. But neither the angel nor the Holy Spirit spoke the gospel directly to the eunuch. The way he learned what he needed to do was by hearing the preaching of the gospel. Think about in the next chapter what happens. Saul sees Jesus in what he calls in Acts 26 a heavenly vision. But what is he told? He is told, you go into Damascus and there you will be told what to do. Jesus in the vision doesn't tell him what he has to do. Ananias has a vision in which he is told that Saul has seen a man named Ananias coming to him in a vision. You know, you know, Saul had two visions. Ananias had a vision. But who went and told him what to do to be saved? Ananias is the one that carried the gospel to him. In Acts the 10th chapter, we have the story of Cornelius, and sometime later we'll look at the story in more detail. But Cornelius had an angel appear to him in a vision. Peter saw a vision of a thing like a sheet let down with the animals that would help him learn to go to the Gentiles. But take note of something that's said in chapter 11 in verse 13. This is Peter recounting the story of having been to the house of Cornelius and said, and he told us, how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. What did the angel say? The angel said, You're going to, 
You're going to need to get Peter to come here and tell you the words by which you are saved. Romans 1.16 says the gospel is the power of God to salvation. In Matthew 28, Jesus sends his apostles to go out into all the world, make disciples of everyone. Mark 16, go preach the gospel to every creature. Luke 24, repentance and remission of sins is to be preached to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And then watch the book of Acts. Not one time is anyone ever told how to be saved, ever told that they were saved in response to a vision, in response to some angelic visit. It was always the preaching of the gospel. There are several implications of that. You know, what's known as Calvinism or Reformed theology it, it is wrong in so many ways. But one of its doctrines is that the doctrine of irresistible grace or the direct operation of the Holy Spirit. Calvinism says that we are born so depraved that we cannot of our own selves choose to respond to the gospel. That the Holy Spirit has to directly change us. Read the book of Acts. What does the Holy Spirit do? Well, he inspired the apostles with the message they were to preach. In the case of the eunuch, he pointed out the chariot and said, that's the place to go. But he never directly caused the conversion. People that think, and and I don't question somebody's honesty if they say, "I, I, I just know I saw a vision. I, I, an angel visited me. I, I'm, I think there are people who genuinely believe that. You know, and I mean, we can have some bizarre dreams sometimes. You know, um, and uh, they can be strange and they can seem so real. But how is a person going to be saved? They're going to be saved, 1 Peter 1, 22, They will purify their souls when they obey the truth. It won't be because God appears to them in a dream, in a vision. An angel comes. When the angel appeared to Cornelius, he said, you get Peter. And Peter's going to preach the gospel to you. No, nobody's saved that way. That means something to me. That means I need to be more diligent about spreading the gospel. I can't sit back and hope, you know, pray. We pray for the salvation of souls. When we pray for the salvation of souls, I'm not saying we limit how God works in every way, but it's clear. He's not going to cause them directly to be converted. Part of the prayer is help me find a man like the eunuch. Help me have the courage to say things. Help me to have the strength and the wisdom and the understanding of how best to approach this person with the gospel. But it's going to be through the gospel. I've got to understand that. There's something else about this man that I think is just an admirable quality in him. Look at what is said about this eunuch, verse 27. And I find it fascinating that His name is never told to us. He's such a great character. And and a lot of attention is given to his conversion. But I don't know what his name was. But I know this. He was a man of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. He had charge of all her treasury. That's a pretty powerful person. And this is a man who has traveled hundreds of miles in order to go to worship in Jerusalem. You know, Ethiopia of the Bible, if you want to look at a modern map, 
It would include the modern, I guess Sudan could be considered a modern country. Uh, you know, but anyway, on a map today looking at Sudan, South Sudan, Ethiopia, you could lump all three of those 21st century countries in. He came a long ways. And his devotion to God is seen in the fact, one, he had something that was unusual in his day. He had his own copy of Isaiah. Most of the time, you know, there were, there were limited copies. They would be in the synagogues. He had his own scroll. He's got this on this, been to Jerusalem. Now he's reading from the prophet as he's going back home. And here comes this stranger up to him. You understand what you're reading? He said, no, I I need some help in this. I I need your guidance. I want us to understand, first of all, I mean, first and foremost, a lesson a lot of people don't understand is that is knowledge of the scriptures is vital. Those words of, of Matthew 22 In verse 29, when the Sadducees tried to entrap Jesus, and he said, you are mistaken not knowing the Scriptures. He adds, nor the power of God. But those words, not knowing the Scriptures, it led to them being mistaken. I need to know the Scripture. I've said many, many times, Matthew 7, 21 says you've got to do the will of the Father But you can't do His will if you don't know what His will is. And the only way to know His will is not guesswork. It's opening up His book. His book that will make you complete. We need to be the kind like 1 Peter 2 describes, like newborn babes desiring the pure milk of the Word. We ought to be like those of Acts 17. It said they search the Scriptures daily. Diligent students, but let me add this. I need to be humble enough to realize, oh, I may think I've got all this intelligence and I've got this education and I'm a hard, diligent student and yet I can still be helped by others. I really... Sometimes I think maybe this quality is overlooked in that man. That a devoutly religious man, that, I mean, that is manifested. You don't make a journey in a chariot. I mean, it's not like he boarded a plane and flew first class. He made a long, hard journey to Jerusalem. Then on his way back, you can imagine him bumping along that road, He's got the scroll out and he's reading some more. He just can't get enough. But he was willing to learn from somebody else. And I think one of the challenges, I know it's been a challenge for me, is sometimes there's somebody that I'm convinced that if we had to take a Bible quiz, I could score a lot higher than they did on this test that my overall knowledge is greater than theirs and yet it may be on a particular subject or a particular application they know more than I do about that you know that sometimes I've missed it am I willing to am I willing to learn from others now there are people who I also acknowledge they know way more than I do, you know, and it's an honor to learn from them. Sometimes it's humbling to learn from somebody that you think less educated, less trained, less experienced. They're a novice. You know, I've been doing this for over 40 years. You know, they couldn't put together a sermon if they had to. And yet, They may have an answer I need. They may be able to help me. We need to be learners. 
as this man was. And then, going back to this again, and I'm not suggesting, I want to make clear, the fact that the man was humble enough to be helped, and this next point, they're not the main points of Acts 8. But they are important. They are valid points. Don't miss Jesus in the Old Testament. This man was reading from what we would call Isaiah 53. You know, he, Isaiah had not yet been divided into chapters. But he used that scripture, Isaiah 53, and preached Jesus to him. You know, Isaiah 53 is one of those, to us, we think, how in the world could a devoutly religious man have wondered who he was talking about. It just seems so obvious of Jesus. And there are many obvious places. But I want you to think about something Jesus said in Luke 24. This is after his resurrection. He said to them, that is to the apostles, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. The law of Moses typically referred to the first five books of the Old Testament. We limit the prophets to the last 17 books. Psalms, of course, is that book of Psalms. But probably here... It was intended to stand for all the books of poetry. But Jesus said, things were written of me throughout the Old Testament. I want us to come to see Jesus everywhere. And I don't mean every single verse. But when I'm reading the story of Adam and Eve, there's a lot I can learn from it about how temptation comes. But perhaps the most important thing is I make sure I think he is that seed that would bruise the head of the serpent. He is the light when darkness first comes into the world. The story of Abraham. What a great and inspiring story of faith. And that's the way the Hebrew writer uses it. To inspire us to have faith. But it is Jesus who is that hope of all nations. The hope of this Gentile right here. It is Jesus who is foreshadowed. Think about Moses. Acts 3 says that he is that prophet like Moses. But in so many ways, when we see Moses, do we not see the foreshadowing of what Jesus would be? The lawgiver? The one who would reveal God's will. Moses revealed God's law to Israel. Jesus came to reveal God's law for us. What did Moses do on Mount Sinai? He stood between the people and God. Who were afraid. Moses foreshadowed that need for a mediator. When Israel would sin, Moses would be that intercessor. When I study about the Passover, do I just get caught up in all the details of the plagues? And those are important. And the 14th, you know, the lamb set aside on the 10th day and killed on the 14th and all this. Or do I realize he was showing us even then that one day there would be one whose blood would cause him to pass over. The tabernacle, as it had God dwelling in the midst of them. And what does Jesus come to do? To be God dwelling in the midst of mankind. He is throughout it. There are ways in which Joseph foreshadows Jesus. And Joshua does. The crossing of the Red Sea. 1 Corinthians 10, Paul makes use of that. I want us to do a better job of 
I want to do a better job of teaching Jesus in the Old Testament. You know, again, we can take things too far. You know, that, you know, when Gideon's 300 men broke the pitchers, you know, I'm not saying that foreshadowed the broken body of Jesus. You know, we, we, can, get, we can get carried away. And yet, he is there. And see him. See him as the focus because what we need to be doing is preaching Jesus. Here in Acts 8, Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, verse 35, preached Jesus to him. That ought not surprise us. Earlier in the fifth verse of this same chapter, he went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. In chapter 11, the same persecution drove some further north up to Antioch. And what did they do? Verse 20. They were preaching the Lord Jesus. They caused people, verse 21, to turn to the Lord. They preached Jesus. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2 that he was determined not to know anything among them except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The focus was on Jesus. I mean, when you preach the Old Testament, the focus is on Jesus. And then you tell the story of the one who came, as John 14 says, if you've known me, you've known the Father. He came to show us God. He came to show mankind, God, what He was like. He came to die for our sins. He came, as was said a little earlier in our talk about the Lord's Supper, to be raised from the dead and to give us that promise of victory over death. He's the intercessor for the righteous, that mediator between God and man. He one day is going to be our judge. And I could go on and on with other things about Jesus. Surely we understand. We've got to preach Jesus. He's got to be the focus of our preaching, the focus of our lives. But when you preach Jesus, one of the things, and it's brought out here, when you preach Jesus, you preach His authority. Notice verse 35, he preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? He didn't just tell the story of Jesus. He told him that Jesus requires a response. In Matthew the 28th chapter, in that account of the Great Commission, he doesn't say, you know, you get out and go tell the world about the Savior. His first words to them in that account are, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The King James says, all power. You know, I have the power, the control. So what do you go and do? You go make disciples, people who will follow me. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. While Jesus was here on earth teaching, he asked the question in Luke 6, 46, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? We need to tell the story of Jesus. And we need to include in that story the fact that He has been given that name which is above every name. That He possesses all authority. He expects His commandments to be obeyed. But I want to caution here. I want to caution us that, and especially those of us who preach, but I think it, it can affect us all. Sometimes we can separate the two to great harm. We can break off the commandments as though almost like there's just this list of things 
you know, God's given a checklist. And, you know, do this, do this, do this. And we separate it from the one who lived and died for us. The one who was raised for us. The one who provides us grace and mercy to help in time of need when we come before his throne, Hebrews 4. You know, it's like we've just given people a list, do all of these things. But we can also swing the other way. And we can say, let's just talk about Jesus. And we forget to talk about the fact that he is king. In that second chapter, as the gospel proclamation begins, what did it say? He has been raised to sit on the throne. Kings give orders. Don't, don't, don't go in either direction. Learn to love him because he first loved us. And know that we must obey him. And that leads us to the last thing I want to say. And that is baptism is vital. Let me read this last little part again. Verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Just as an aside, doesn't this give us some idea about how baptism was done in the first century. They're riding along and though I guess I can't say with absolute certainty, it would have been a rarity for any travelers not to have carried water with them. To have had skins, those bottles. They don't stop and use water from one of those. They don't go get water and bring it back up to them. They both go down to the water. They both go down into the water. Very compatible with what's said in Romans 6, 4 about being buried in baptism. But the key I want to stress this morning, we can't preach Jesus and not preach baptism. Romans 6, in verse 3, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. There are people that will say things along the line of, you really shouldn't stress baptism you know, preach all these doctrinal issues, just preach Jesus. The eunuch, what did he hear? He heard Philip preach Jesus. And he interrupted Philip to say, here's the water. Why can't I be baptized? Jesus and baptism go together, but somebody occasionally will bring up a passage like 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 17. This is one of the favorites to say that you're wrong. Preaching Jesus and baptism are two very separate things. Verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Paul wasn't sent to baptize, he was just sent to preach. Okay, let's think about this for a moment. In Acts the 18th chapter in verse 8, Paul is in the city of Corinth, that's who he's writing to right here, and he preached. And what does it say happened when the Corinthians believed his message? And many of the Corinthians hearing believed 
and were baptized. They were baptized as a result of his preaching. Then, look at this text in context. Verse 10, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Be unified, he says. Well, here's the situation. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel. In context, what's he saying? He said, my job is to preach the gospel. I don't have to administer the baptism. In fact, he said, in your cases, I'm glad that I personally baptize very few of you because you might say I baptized in my own name. What's that implying? They were baptized in somebody's name. But it wasn't the name of Paul. Verse 13. Is Christ divided? No. Was Paul crucified for you? Well, no. Christ was crucified for you. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. They were baptized in the name of Jesus. Many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. 1 Corinthians 10 In verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and he sets up this analogy. Why does he say they were baptized into Moses? Because these folks have been baptized into Christ. What Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 is not that I failed to preach baptism. Just like the eunuch when he preached Jesus. Paul preached baptism in the name of Jesus. In the name of the one that was crucified for them. I mean, you go through the book of Acts. When somebody denigrates the importance of baptism, I just wonder if they've ever read the book. And I don't mean that in an ugly way, but you read through the book of Acts. The very first sermon ends, what shall we do? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In verse 41, those who gladly received his word were baptized. In Acts the 8th chapter, when the Samaritans believed the preaching of Philip, it says... They were baptized, both men and women. When Simon believed, he was baptized. When the eunuch hears Jesus preached, he says, I want to be baptized. When Ananias comes to tell Paul or Saul what he must do, verse 18, he arose and was baptized. And he himself will explain it later in chapter 22, in verse 16, and say, I was asked, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. In chapter 10, when we've had a most remarkable event happen, when the Holy Spirit has come upon these people and they've actually begun to speak in tongues, 
Still, look what happens. Verse 47, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And you can just go on. When the heart of Lydia was opened, Acts 16, what does she do? She is baptized. When the jailer is commanded to believe on the Lord Jesus to be saved, what does he do? He's baptized the same hour of the night. There is a consistent pattern. And it's corroborated by the rest. Go make disciples. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Read earlier, Romans 6, 3 and 4. You're baptized into the death of Christ. Galatians 3, 26. You're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The last one, 1 Peter, the third chapter. He's using Noah and the ark. And he says in verse 20, eight souls were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's an antitype that now saves us. Baptism. We preach Jesus. We preach that one who died for us. But we realize that in order to have our sins washed away, we have to do what he says. And we have to be baptized into Christ. Don't let anyone fool you. Baptism is absolutely essential. We've seen several important points this morning. But I want to close with this one. When that chariot was stopped and they both went down into the water and he was baptized, it said the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. It may be this morning there's someone who's never yet been baptized into Christ that feels only the guilt of sin, not the joy of salvation. Why don't you imitate that eunuch today? We would be glad to help you. You just let us know what you desire to do as we come and stand and sing together. The Redeemer died on the cross, died for the sinner, paid all his due.
thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel. And in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up. And we believe you'll find these to be true to God's word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.